The next ship in the April 22 tour, after having visited USS Yorktown, was on the other side of the country. So those of you who can recognise the profile might recognise this as USS Iowa, and those of you who don't recognise the profile, well, um, there's a big sign on the gangplank on the left of the picture. So yes, that's where we are, in the port of Los Angeles, aboard the original Iowa-class battleship. And we're going to be looking at some of what you can see in the upper works of the ship. So above the main deck and then immediately one deck below. As there's a fair amount that you can see in this area. And of course it means we have Wisconsin coming up in two or three videos time. And yes, over to the right there are some evergreen ships. That did cause me a little bit of trepidation because who knows what they could do. They might just drift out of the port and uh, block the channel. They're known to be doing that. <laughs> But in any case, once you come aboard, one of the first things you'll notice on the forward part of the deck is they have a series of displays of various shells. Now, this one's quite interesting. This is set up on turret one, and this shows you the three primary types of anti-aircraft shell that were available to the Iowa. The little one down there at the bottom right is the Orlikon 20 millimeter round. And next to it, substantially larger, is the Bofors 40mm round. So you can see why towards the end of the war, the 20 mils were beginning to go by the board and the 40 mil was beginning to take over because, well, it's easy enough to say the Orlikon was significantly outranged by the Bofors and the Bofors could hit a lot harder. That's all well and good on paper, but it's only when you actually see the dimensions of the two rounds that you realize, yeah, that's, that's quite a lot of firepower. Now, of course, that does mean you can store much less 40mm ammunition in any given room compared to 20mm ammunition. But, for example, an Orlikon 20mm round is basically the round you get there, whereas the 40mm round you can have a fragmenting round to provide a bit of an airburst effect. But over to the left you have the 5-inch round. And, well, there you can see the 5-inch round itself, just the projectile, is considerably larger than even the combined case and projectile for the 40 mil. And then you have this lovely big brass cartridge, which is of course the propellant charge for the five inch projectile. An overall brilliant demonstration of the square cube law in action, because of course a 40 millimeter projectile is double the linear width of a 20 mil, but is substantially larger volumetrically as you can see. And at 127 millimeters, the five inch round is technically speaking only a fraction over three times the linear width of the 40 millimeter shell, but once again is definitely much more than three times the volume. But moving on around turret one, you also come across this wonderful little display. Now this is actually showing you how you move shells around on the deck when you're reloading the ship, but also how those shells are then loaded down into the magazines. Now, you'll notice a few things. Firstly, you have the charge cases that you'll be familiar with from the videos on Massachusetts, New Jersey, and North Carolina. They've got some actual charge bags out there as well. Obviously, the charge bags wouldn't actually be out on deck during reloading, but it's for visitors to understand what they're looking at. And you also have these little carts or dollies, and this is how you move the charges and the shells around on the ship whilst you're in the process of moving ammunition from side or from a resupply ship into the magazines. You can roll them around. There is video footage on both US and British ships of sailors quite happily rolling shells and charge cases around, but it's a lot safer and frankly a lot easier to use these things. It also means you have a lot more directional control because of course if you're just rolling the shell it can only go in one of two directions, whereas with the cart and the wheels you can take it all over the place. Now, something else you might notice is that we've got this little crane arm that is lowering this blue inert round. Now, this is, of course, attached to turret one, and as you can see, can be used to raise and lower the shell. So you can maneuver turret one and the crane arm will move, and this arm can also then be taken down and stored when the ship's in combat, because you don't necessarily want a big slab of metal with some steel cabling hanging around in an area where the turret might get hit. And then slightly further back along, you've got another little crane arm sticking out, and this one has a different colored shell. So what are all these different shells, you might think? We've already mentioned there's an inert round. That's the blue one. There was also that blunt-nosed gold one. And then there's this one, which is mostly black with some silver banding and a yellow cap. 
Well, handily, there is a little diagram to explain this available. So you can see the gold flat cap round on the left, that's the dummy round. You've then got two types of practice rounds, so that's the inert blue ones that we've seen. You then have the green rounds, so the green round that's just green with a yellow cap, that's high capacity or high explosive, so that's a round that they would have had available on Iowa in World War II. There's this kind of cluster munition variant that has the yellow checker on it, that's a post-war innovation. Then you've got the one that we just saw, which has the yellow cap, mostly black body and silver banding, that's your armour piercing shell, your super heavy 2,700 pound shell. There's another black variant, which is again an AP round, but has a die marker in it. So this is very useful for working out who is shooting at what, uh, especially in the era before radar. And then finally, another kind of round, the nuclear round, which again was not available to the ship during World War II. And in fact, there's a whole convoluted story behind the nuclear round, but that's a subject for another video. Now, of course, the purpose of these little cranes is to get the shells in the vertical position so that they can go down the loading hatch dash shoot, which will then take the shells down into the shell rooms. This being a distinctive feature of US battleships, both in terms of the shells going down and the shells coming up, they use this base first nose up position. Whereas in most, say, British battleships, they have shells stored and taken back up to the guns in a horizontal position, although that's not always the case, but it is an interesting distinguishing feature. There's also an inert shell laid out with all six charges behind it, ready to go. Now, bear in mind that each of those cases that you saw, the silver cases with the charges, those hold three, so you need two cases worth of charges to make up the full charge to propel the shell. And this gives you some idea of everything that has to be loaded into the 16-inch guns in order to get those shells downrange. The more eagle-eyed amongst you will have noted that we are in an area where the deck is currently covered in plywood, uh, whereas in other photos there are elements of teak. So, of course, as with most museum ships, they are in an ongoing process of maintenance. So just because these photos taken in April 2022 show that there's plywood down on some of the four deck areas doesn't mean that when you go there, uh, the plywood will be there. It may very well be teak by this point. And here's a bit of a closer shot. You can see the detail of how the shell is held. It's got these two clasping arms around the middle and then a collar up top as well to make sure it doesn't tip. And then going back to the dummy shell and charge case, you get a little bit of a better idea about what you'd need to do to actually move these things around. Although, of course, since they are display pieces, uh, please don't actually try to move them. And obviously being forward, you can get a view up towards the bow, which is at this point currently barriered off at the very extremity for safety purposes. And you've also got that, at least to me, frankly horrific semi-Christmas tree of an antenna that was added in the 1980s. But, well, there's precious little you can do about it these days. So, leaving the sh literal shadow of the guns, we're going to make our way down the port side and follow the route into the ship. After, of course, a quick glare at our nemesis. So, we're going to start making our way slightly higher in the ship. But first we have to go through this hatch where you can see to the bottom right of the picture, and there's a few interesting bits on this level first. You of course have an array of well-maintained officers' quarters, so this gives you an idea how some of the senior staff would have lived whilst the ship was in operational service. And yes, even for officers, that's a bunk bed. But a slightly higher station in life might get you your own room. But even in officers' country, this isn't a hotel, so no en suites really to speak of. So there's a collective heads with showers as well. And another example of a single cabin. Well, if you're into interior decoration, I really hope you like grey. But coming out of that, we come to another section of the ship's ability to reload itself. This is for the powder, because the powder and the shells are obviously stored in slightly different areas. And yes, this is literally right outside officer's country because, of course, this is a warship, not a floating hotel. So you have to just put up with these kinds of things in the middle of your accommodation. And yes, if you look through what's now obviously a perspex overhatch, because otherwise someone will inevitably fall down, you can see some lockers from the deck further down. So if you were in that area of the ship, more enlisted personnel type of accommodation, you would have to put up when the ship was reloading with canisters of powder just being lowered through your living quarters or possibly raised if they'd been expended. And with a little bit of judicious use of arms, you can actually see how far down that goes. 
it's quite the distance and you can see part way down there there's an armoured hatch as opposed to just the regular little holes that you've got in the upper deck. That of course being where it passes through the ship's deck armour. Now something you might have noticed is that this is just about at least inside the ship as opposed to where the shells are reloaded which is outside the ship at least when you're on the upper deck we are still on the same level so how do you get the canisters into here because you're not going to really be lifting well 330 pounds of powder plus the weight of the canister plus the weight of the dolly or truck you're not going to be lifting that over the lintel of a hatchway well let me show you so you have the motorised hoist for going down into the ship. You have this motorised hoist which runs on this rail, which is a common feature in all ammunition handling areas of the ship for the 16-inch guns. And it runs through here. You can see there's some cabins and so forth either side. And going out of this hatch, you can see where we are relative to turret 1. So we go up one level and we come across this. It's a small rangefinder. And I was very excited to see this because not only is it working, but you can also train it. Now, obviously, there are much larger examples in the various fire control spotting towers across the ship, Mark 37s and Mark 38s, and, of course, there's the massive ones in the turrets. But for one thing, they don't really tend to turn anymore, and for a second thing, depending on the ship, they may or may not be in working condition. Obviously, if they don't turn, they're usually fixed on a horizon. But with this one, you actually can demonstrate in detail how at least one form of rangefinder works. So of course we can swing it around and point it at something we'd really really like to put to the bottom and here you can see that we are slightly out of focus so this is what I've been talking about when I've been mentioning rangefinding equipment in the video on it and elsewhere. You can see we have a picture at the top, a picture at the bottom but we've ended up with this kind of sawtooth shape where we should have a continuous strake of bow and obviously the picture's not particularly fantastic because I had to jam my phone right up to the lens whereas once you're looking at it in with your eyes it's actually a much better view but you get the general idea and you've also got this little range dial down there at the bottom which you can also see and that's obviously based on the settings you have it set at, at the moment it's telling you well this is the focal range that the rangefinder is set at and therefore if it's lined up properly that's what the actual range is as well at the moment obviously it is out of sync so let's try and get it in sync and here you can see what it looks like once the two are aligned now there is some slight difference in the image that's coming through on the lower and upper optical sets that's probably just age related and unfortunately in this particular photo the range dial is slightly obscured but as you can probably tell if you compare the previous photo with this one we're looking at a range of about 330 to 340 yards to the bow of this ship. But then I thought, let's see what it's like if we look further out. So this is what you would see standing behind it as you swing it out, looking towards the harbour entrance. You can see there's a building right at the end of the promontory there in roughly the middle of the top of the photo. So let's have a look at what that looks like through this, again, relatively small rangefinder. And as you can see, with it having been set for the few hundred yards that our previous target was at, it is massively, massively out of whack for targeting that building, which we can see now actually has a water tower on it and is in a rather fetching shade of terracotta brick, I guess. So with a quick adjustment of the dials, you can see now the upper image is in line with the lower image. So this means that the rangefinder is now set focused on that building so the range figure it should give is the actual range to the target and of course this is much easier for me to do even with a small range finder here because Iowa herself isn't really appreciably moving all that much uh, the targets are relatively close the targets are not moving themselves uh, which obviously an active target would be and they have fairly regular shapes, so it's fairly easy to get the alignment right. And you can see why, therefore, you would have things like irregular shapes and camouflage patterns to try and make this job somewhat more difficult in times of war. And then by changing the angle of my phone camera a little bit, you can now tell that the Port of Los Angeles warehouse number one is almost exactly 3,450 yards away from this rangefinder. So if we happened to be targeting it, uh, we could relay that information down to the plot room 
who would then update what the gun barrels needed to do. And of course, this brings us closer to the main command superstructure. So you can see the various bridge levels here and just popping off to the top left, the large antenna, again, a post-war addition, I believe, to the Iowa class, which I've always thought when you look at them up close from the bow kind of makes them look a little insectile, kind of looks like a pair of insect antenna, but maybe that's just me. And as you can see, we're now on the same level as the lower 5-inch 38 mounts, but one level lower than the upper 5-inch 38 mounts. But over here to the left, you can see the various awards and campaign ribbons, etc., that Iowa earned during her service career. And here we are looking at the aft of one of the 5-inch 38 mounts. I believe this is the second mount uh, on the port side that's obviously trained out to port. And it is always a little bit fascinating to me that when you look at the front of the mounts, they are very angular. You look at the back of the mounts and they are very cylindrical. You get a very different idea about what they look like overall if you just looked at them from one side or the other. And as we make our way inside to ascend to another level, we come across this wonderful bit of trunking, which is of course part of the hoist system heading up to one of the upper level 5-inch 38 mounts. So we've come up one more level. We are now at the same level as the upper 5-inch mounts, but we came across this little thing. This is a wonderful little signaling light. So let's have a bit of a closer look at that. As you can see, it is still functional. I mean, you could put some power to it and it would probably transmit, although I would not suggest doing that when you're looking straight at it. But you can use this to, of course, signal in Morse code to challenge or respond to challenges. And here at the forwardmost 5-inch mount, you can see what I mean by the front of the 5-inch mounts being considerably more angular. And sticking out of it on the right-hand side there is one of the little ears that signifies that this mount also has its own little rangefinder. You'll find these all over the ship. Also nearby, there's a ready-use ammunition locker, which has a sign that, unfortunately, the photo came out a bit blurred, so I'm just going to have to roughly make it out. But I do like how, when it comes to the live ammunition in said ready-use ammunition locker, it says that when the box is open, the following are forbidden within 20 feet of it. Smoking, hot metal, hot objects, fine. Matches, lighters, sources of flames, heat and sparks, fine. Steel or iron tools, Okay, they might strike sparks. Non-watertight portable electric cord. Well, who's bringing non-watertight portable electric cord on a battleship anyway? Bright work polish <laughs> and any other inflammables. And, and then it gets worse. No person will undertake welding, riveting, soldering or other operations which may overheat this box unless he has de definitively determined that all ammunition has been removed from it in its vicinity. Who would weld a live ammunition box? Really? I suppose the fact that the side is up means someone at some point tried, but there you go. <laughs> Moving on closer to the command areas, came across this rather wonderful example of spotting binoculars. And this goes back to something I mentioned a few videos ago when it comes to Japanese night fighting optics. The fact that they may well be described as binoculars, but there's handheld binoculars and then there's the lookout binoculars and they are substantially larger and therefore they tend to come on these supported swiveling mounts, as is the case with this particular one. And yes, for those of you who are wondering, at least at the time that I was there, it does work. But of course, um, unlike with the rangefinder where there's a single lens to look through, this has two lenses to look through and I, well, I don't have two lenses on the camera, so you just have to content yourself with gazing upon its magnificence. And now we're coming into the realm of the actual command area where the various bridges are, and you might be able to tell this is a compass. Again, in the interest of redundancy, there are many of these scattered through the ship. And here we arrive at something rather unique about Iowa specifically. Now, it's not the fact that there's a conning tower. There is, of course, a conning tower on all four Iowa class. But this conning tower is on the O3 level, the Admiral's Bridge, as well as on the O4 level, which is the Helm Conning Bridge, and the O5 level, which is the Fire Control Station. Now, on New Jersey, Missouri, and Wisconsin, the conning tower is on O4 and O5. But because Iowa was the first ship in the class, she was fitted as a full-scale flagship, a task force flagship. The other three can serve as division flagships, and indeed did, but as a task force flagship, Iowa had specific modifications to enable her to carry a significant size admiral staff, and one of those modifications was the extension of this conning tower down to the level where the admiral may well be. 
Now, some of you may remember that USS South Dakota was also modified as a flagship, but with the South Dakota, with such space as was available, bearing in mind they're fairly cramped vessels, she had to lose her forward two 5-inch 38 mounts. Whereas on Iowa, because she's considerably larger, they were able to make these modifications without the need of losing any 5-inch 38 mounts. So Iowa has the same number of 5-inch 38 emplacements as her sister ships does. And you can see we are at 03 looking out over turret 2. Now, of course, your vision is considerably more restricted with the viewing slits of a conning tower. And so if you're looking at wartime photos, one easy way, if you can see this area of the ship, uh, obviously on the exterior, is Iowa has a trio of 20 millimeter guns mounted on turret two, whereas the other three have a 40 millimeter emplacement. And that's because the 40 millimeter emplacement is too large. It would block the view from the viewing slits of the conning tower. Whereas when you're just looking at more regular window panes, you can kind of work around that. And obviously it's less likely to be occupied by an admiral. So on the others, you have the 40, Iowa's you have the 20s. It's a nice visual indicator for quick reference. And of course, there's also the flag plot room on the same O3 level so that intelligence and data as what's going on can be communicated to the Admiral without interfering with the captain who will be slightly higher up trying to run the ship. And then we go up a level to O4. This is the Helm Conning Bridge. And as you can see, the Conning Tower continues on upwards and is open, but you can see it's also now wrapped around in this enclosed bridge structure as well. Now, of interest is a little sign on this level. There are speed limits for the ship if you are at certain depths. Now, as you can see, there is a footnote there which is beneath keel. So speed versus depth guidelines. If the depth of water beneath the keel is 10 feet or less, then the ship is supposed to go very slowly and use extreme caution. If it's between one and a half and 15 fathoms, you may proceed up to 15 knots. Between 15 and 25 fathoms, your speed is supposed to be equal to the depth. So at 25 fathoms, you go 25 knots and so on down. And then it says 100 fathoms or greater, you may go up to full power. Now, a fathom is, of course, six feet. So 1.5 fathoms is nine, ten-ish feet. So that's basically going on from the 10 foot or less. 15 fathoms is 90 feet. And then you can work it out for yourself from then on 100 fathoms, obviously being 600 feet. Now, whilst those are guidelines, I rather suspect the ship may go to full power in less than 600 foot depth of water below the keel. But it's very interesting to note, especially at the shallower depths, because, of course, a ship will sit slightly aft when it's running at full power as well. And you can see quite the remarkable difference in view just from having gone up one level. Also, helpfully, when they installed all this bridge equipment, you'll notice that they installed it between the view slits and not under the view slits. So if somebody is in the conning tower in the middle of action and somebody's trying to use any of this equipment, you're not going to end up with somebody blocking the view. So, you know, it's the little things that count. Also, just behind the conning tower on this level is this small but attractive bell. And of course, Drac find bell, Drac must ring bell. And a very pleasing tone it has to it too. Moving out and going up, we come across one of four CIWS mounts. These are, of course, 1980s 20mm phalanx installations, which are distinctly not World War II compliant, but, well, they're here, so let's make a note that they are present. But advancing back towards the bow, we come across one of the four Mark 37 spotting installations that are scattered through the ship. You have one fore, one aft, and one per side amidships. And that, of course, brings us up to the O5 level. As you can see, there is a final level of the conning tower. There's the hatch to access it there on the right. And as you can also see, we have this complete mishmash of technology. So we've got the conning tower, the little periscope there in the middle that's popping up. That's all original features. But then you also have this little rather more modern radar that's stuck on top of it from later in its service career. And of course, the two little antenna arrays just forward. Also present, we have a searchlight, and you can tell that this is a searchlight as opposed to a signalling light by the fact that you do not have any of those shuttered louvres which would allow you to flash signals. This instead is just a pure searchlight with an iris if you want to shut it off. And this provides you with some good context as to what you're looking at at this level. So you've got the Mark 37 there with its uh, 
post refit radar stuck on it and you've got the rest of the superstructure proceeding up above us and just at the top there you can see the ears of the mark 38 main spotting array so that's for the fire, main guns fire control systems at least to start with all of these fire control systems are interdependent so you can run data from one the other both or many but in ideal circumstances this little mark 37 up front here will be spotting for the 5 inch 38s and the bigger mark 38 system up there will be spotting for the 16 inch guns and of course on top of the conning tower you have the periscope to allow people inside to have a look around and see what's going on I would not advise knocking on the top of the conning tower. You're not going to ring the bell of anybody inside. You're just going to end up with some bruised knuckles. And of course, since this is also a bridge level, you need all the requisite equipment. So RPM indicators, so you know how fast you're going and a way to communicate down with the engine room. An even better view than you get on 04, at least as long as it's not raining. And of course, your rudder and course indicators, so you know which way the ship is steering. There's also a speed indicator there in knots if you can't do the RPM to knots translation quickly. Bonus points if you can decipher what the flag signal of the day is saying. And now we're on our way aft and we're passing through the most modernised area of the ship. So we've got subrock chaff launchers, a vertiginous view up to the radar platform, and then we arrive at the full missile deck. So here we can see some of the Tomahawk box launchers in their stowed positions. And the Harpoon missile launchers, at least on the starboard side here, which are of course in a fixed launch position pointing upwards, whereas the Tomahawk launchers can elevate or be put flat for storage. Now when I came across this, which is obviously next to the Harpoon launchers, I was a little bit perplexed by the order of things, because I would have thought initially, obviously if Harpoon missiles start leaking fuel, yes you want to shut off power to the launcher, but I would have thought the next stage would have been to clear unnecessary personnel and ignition sources from the area before telling your supervisor about it. Um, that kind of brought to mind images of someone going, yes, yes, there is lots of harpoon missile fuel leaking everywhere. Do everyone just stay where you are and I'm going to go and find the officer of the deck. Uh, but then I realised, of course, that, well, you would hope that most of the crewmen would know to get out of the way of a spill of missile fuel. So telling the supervisor that, you know this has happened we need to deal with it is probably a good idea because most of the uh, part c there is probably going to take care of itself and here's the full battery of the starboard harpoon missile system with obviously a crws popped up just next to it these systems along with the tomahawk launchers you see here are what replaced the aftmost four twin five inch 38 positions which is why these days the iowas only have three uh, five inch 38 positions on each side instead of five so if you want to see a world war ii battleship that retains all five of its wartime heavy anti-aircraft and secondary surface gun positions you will have to go and see alabama massachusetts or north carolina which do retain those but just beyond the box launchers you can see the mark 38 rangefinder director tower so this is again on this mini pyramidal mount and this is the aft of the two primary rangefinders for the ship 16 inch guns as i mentioned earlier of course you can use the mark 38s as well and the mark 38 that's mounted forward is mounted higher than the forward mark 37 because it's a little bit lighter but any and or all of them will do and it's important to note actually that the retention of these systems is not just a whimsy of the US Navy during the 1980s, because of course they were trying to spare as much top weight as possible for the missile launchers, and if these things were useless, they would have been gone. But in actual fact, they discovered that the fire control computers down in the plot rooms below, combined with these rangefinding systems and of course radar input, actually made for as good a rangefinding set of equipment for the 16 inch guns as you were ever likely to get 1980s full computer fire control systems couldn't really do much better so that's why these were retained then we're heading down towards the aft end of the ship we come through one of the major mess areas sadly unlike the north carolina this is not on a slope so you can't ski down through the mess area but on the other hand you can't ski down through the mess area so it's much flatter and much more accessible now as you head further aft, there is an entire section dedicated to the turret 2 explosion, which of course Iowa is either famous or infamous for, which happened in the 1980s. 
and this is one element of the exhibit. Now I'm not going to go through this particular area in any great detail because, well, A, I encourage you to go and see it for yourself, and B, the USS Iowa itself, the museum, has a rather excellent video detailing the whys, wherefores, and hows of what happened that day. So hopefully I will remember to either link it in the video description or in some kind of uh, little card appearing to the top right of the screen at the moment. But either way, I do urge you to go and have a look at that for a full comprehensive review of the history of the Turret 2 explosion. On a brighter note, in these aft spaces, there's also a museum area that goes over a brief history of capital ships and warships. Uh, this particular panel is discussing the Dreadnought era, uh, but it goes back and forward past this point. There's also the Lost at Sea exhibit, which goes through various stories and images from shipwrecks that were explored by Dr. Ballard, who's obviously most famous for discovering the Titanic's wreck, but also went down and had a look uh, for Bismarck and a number of other wrecks that have cropped up over the world, including some of the wrecks from Midway and Guadalcanal. So all really good museum level content that's definitely worth a look. And then as you head even further off, you come through the ship's laundry. And yes, these are giant tumble dryers. And yes, they've been pop riveted shut because yes, people were climbing into them. Also available in these lower museum spaces, you get such wonderful things as this. This is the bore brush for a 16 inch gun. Now, you might immediately notice that unlike the brush you have on, say, a cannon, like you might find on HMS Victory or USS Constitution, this does not come on the end of a long stick. Well, can you imagine the length of stick you'd need to go down a 16 inch 50 gun barrel? Instead, as you can see on the top, it has a little ring mount, and so you would attach that to a rope or chain, probably a rope to be perfectly honest, and then haul that through the gun whilst the gun is at a low elevation. And there's a small section of a 16 inch barrel so you can take a look at the rifling, which you can see is rather complex and rather dense. You can see this particular bit of rifling has been a little bit damaged down there on the bottom, which probably explains why it was removed. this particular barrel was removed from the ship. But these are the things that engage the copper driving bands on the shells that you see to give the shells their spin. And then there's a pair of models to answer some very inevitable questions and comparisons between an Iowa class and a Yamato class battleship. Now, as you can see here, okay, there is a little bit of force perspective because I am taking this picture from the side of the case that has the Iowa on it. But as you can see, uh, the battleship Iowa and its three sister ships are in fact longer than a Yamato class battleship. So then why does a Yamato class battleship have, depending on which particular tonnage figures you're using, somewhere between 20 and 30,000 tons displacement over an Iowa class. Well, if you look from a front-on view, you get the answer. The Iowa is sleek. Uh, the Yamato is somewhat less so. It has considerably wider beam, and obviously that is going to make up a lot of additional volume, which explains where all the additional displacement comes from. Plus, of course, the insanely thick armor layout on the Yamatos, which is not going to help with that displacement issue. And perhaps one of the other interesting things to note is that although Yamato in this case is depicted in a kind of mid-war configuration, so she's lost the wing-mounted triple sixes but hasn't gained the absolute nest of anti-aircraft guns she would have towards the end of her service life, it's quite interesting to note just how much of the ship's sides is taken up by anti-aircraft armament. With the Yamato's decision to go with these super-firing triple sixes fore and aft and the blast effects of the 18-inch guns, because those 18-inch guns are actually closer together than the 16-inch turrets of the Iowa class, that's not necessarily in terms of spacing between the first and second turrets, but spacing between the forward and aft turrets, you actually have a relatively limited amount of space on a Yamato as compared to an Iowa to fit a secondary battery. Now, whilst this is compensated for partly by the greater beam, allowing you to nest a lot of light and medium AA in that central section, one does have to wonder if 
in the design process, the Yamatos had decided that actually we're going to not have these super firing triple sixes fore and aft. We're going to maybe elongate the superstructure slightly so that the bridge comes right up behind the forwards 18 inch guns and the superstructure goes all the way back to the aft 18 inch guns. You could perhaps thin out the central superstructure a little bit more and then you'd have much, much more space, roughly comparable actually with the amount of space along the side in terms of length that you have on an Iowa to fit secondaries. So your secondaries would have to be either one side or the other rather than the sort of 270 degree fire arc of the triple sixes. But let's face it, those triple sixes ended up not actually being tremendously useful. And then factor in the additional beam and well, the Yamato wouldn't have survived Operation Tengo anyway, but she might have given a slightly better accounting of herself. And then brings us to the fantail of Iowa with turret three. There's a helicopter you can just about see hiding there on the right hand side. And actually a really, really nice food concessions um, truck, van. I don't know exactly what it called. But it's parked on the fantail anyway, and it does some really, really nice hot dogs, amongst other things. Uh, there's also the ship's gift shop, the access to which, or egress from, you can just see with this little covered access point just underneath the aft guns. Now, of course, there is more of Iowa to see, but these are pretty much the areas of Iowa that I got to see on my particular visit on that particular day. So... With that, we will wrap up our visit to the USS Iowa over in Los Angeles and obviously encourage people to go and have a look themselves. Maybe take a different tour route and see the other bits that aren't shown in this particular tour. Take the same tour route, have a look through those museum sections aft or the bits that I have shown you. You can have a look in considerably more detail. It is, of course, a rather wonderful ship to visit. And as you may have noticed from some of the more overarching shots, there is parking right next to it, which is quite useful. So that was a brief review of my day on the second Iowa class and fourth ever battleship that I'd ever been on. And of course, as we're drawing towards the end of the USA 2022 tour content we have three more ships left to look at which will be the carrier uss midway the battleship uss alabama and then wrapping up with the third iowa class battleship that i've seen uss wisconsin so look forward to those videos coming out over the next three months and see you again in another video that's it for this video Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.